My name is Natalia Garci. I'm the Executive Director of the Open Data Charter. We're going to talk about COVID Open Data and what we did with collaboration with a lot of organizations throughout 2020 and 2021. And uh, I'm prepared to know what the Open Data Charter is. So we were launched in 2015. We are a collaboration between governments and civil society organizations and experts working in open data, share, uh, based on a shared of principles that were, were actually agreed upon after a year and a half of global discussions. You can see here the six principles that comprehend the Open Data Charter, which is a document, but also when the Open Data Charter was launched, there was a decision made to create a, an organization that helped promote these principles. And so here we are. I'm leading that organization right now. You can check a lot of more information about the principles and the work that we do in, in our web page. Here is, a, is an overview of the adopters of the charter. So the charter, as I said, it's, it's a document. You can see all the national governments that have, have adopted the charter and have agreed to, to promote open data uh, policies that look upon the open data principles of the charter. And then you can also see all the local and subnational governments that have adopted the charter, which are the majority. So we do have a lot of uh, subnational governments adopting the and uh, please do look into our web page for more information on this. And let me tell you about the first project that, that uh, we worked on during the, the first years of the pandemic, which is a collaboration between the open data charter and OECD, which we called Policy Plus. This is a project that was born out of conversations like we were in March of 2020, we were just getting started with a near two year strategy. And, and we decided, of course, because of what was going on and a personal and institutional and institutional changes needed to be made. And so we started talking with all uh, types of organizations that actually work with us to understand how from the open data standpoint of view, we could help understanding a little bit more what was going on. Policy Plus is one of the projects and then Juan is going to explain the second project that we worked uh, on. So let's go to Policy Plus. Policy Plus is an initiative that, that started from trying to understand uh, kind of how governments needed to be prepared in order to, to respond to, in this case, a pandemic. So we identified six target areas that governments should be working or should have worked, but in this case should be working right now, that needed strengthening as to be working from an open data and open government perspective in understanding and responding to health emerge. So we consulted, of course, with OECD members, but also with non-OECD members that are adopters of the charter and uh, created this document that include practices on open data, on data governance and open government. And we developed short-term, so immediate and long-term policy calls for governments to uphold within these six areas. And let me take you through this timeline and the six areas. So in uh, September of 2020, sorry, I forgot to put the years there. So in September, sorry, of 2021, we started a campaign of brainstorming to understand what had been done, what hadn't been done, which were the challenges that governments met trying to, to respond to, to the pandemic, understanding all the, the policies that they've developed and the emergency policies that they've developed in, in order to do that. In October, we launched uh, the Policy Plus initiative. It didn't even have that name at, at, at the beginning to understand how the community would respond to this. So we made consultations with Open Data Charters adopters and OECD members to understand how a document like this could actually be helpful and if they were willing also to participate in this. We also consulted with civil society organizations, of course, that are part of the community of the Open Data Charter. In November, we actually held a, a, a formal meeting with the implementation working group, which is a monthly gathering of open data charters community, not only governments, but also civil society representatives. And we took upon the meeting of November to understand if the policy areas that we were thinking about uh, developing actually made sense. We got a lot of, of comments and inputs on what was needed, what was met, what was already done, examples of governments dealing with data governance throughout the pandemic and what were the, the good examples and the don'ts. Um, so we did that meeting. And in that same time year, we, the OECD actually led a formal consultation with, with government stakeholders to understand what was actually the, the results of that, of those discussions and the understanding between governments. Last February, we actually published the blog and launched the, the Policy Plus document, which you can see in our webpage. 
And throughout this, this year, we hope to keep the conversation going and understand how these proposals of immediate and, and long-term policies look like in, in reality and figure out if we can help implement those policies throughout the globe. So in one of the, one of the, let's go to the six, uh, six areas. So one of the areas is leadership and collaboration to understand how to design and deliver open government data throughout health um, emergencies. And the, the questions that we wanted to understand and we wanted to figure out uh, what to do with was uh, what types of leaders, teams and institutions do we need to facilitate timely access to, to the data in times of, of response. We saw a lot of governments that didn't have the um, governance structure, neither the, the technical one nor the, the legal one to share, to share and collaborate even between ministries of the same administration or between different levels of governance. And then, of course, tackling into that, what kind of channels enable governments and, and agencies to, to work together in these harsh times. The other, the other area was, as I said, collaboration. So how do we also facilitate the culture? Because we know that working horizontally between governments and horizontally between the different levels of governments and opening up data is not just a technical challenge, but also has to do with culture change. And that actually takes time. So what can governments do in, in immediate response and how can governments actually work in the long term to create uh, that cultural change within the administrations, in the different levels of administrations within, within one government and even creating networks of collaboration among government like you different countries in order to be able to de to develop this, this response to health emergencies in the different contexts. And of course, all the legal and technical arrangements that need to happen. One of the, one of the most in important and the one that had more, more inputs in as, a, as an area within policy class is equity. So how do we make sure that we're placing vulnerable and representative and mar marginalized groups at the center of a data-driven response? And so, for example, one of the, some of the recommendations are to make efforts to provide information about data in official and inclusive re regional dialects so that every citizen is actually able to be informed about what's, what is going on, what's the government uh, response to this health emergency. And also investment, of course, Invest, investing resources to expand the generation, the collection and the analysis of relevant disaggregated and anonymized data. So we need to make sure that we, we take uh, into account that we need everybody to count, as, as the UN said a couple of years ago in their data program. Everybody needs to be counted, but also taking into account privacy and how we actually work the data governance, the data creation in order to understand the, the sorry, the privacy breaches that we might create if we publish the data in certain uh, platforms. So equity is one of the biggest discussions. And of course, you can read the whole document. It's online, but I, I wanted just to bring in these two, these two immediate policy calls. Trust. So maintaining public trust while navigating a pandemic or a crisis, a health crisis is super important. We work specifically on trust as one of the core of the core areas. And for example, one of the short term policy goals is to ensure that we grant public access to governmental data so that they understand what is going on. What are the decisions that the government is actually making? Where are the public funds going? Where are they located? How the, the for example, the medicines and the, and sorry, the hospitals are, uh, are placed within the national territory. So understanding that data, it's important. It's, it's a matter of public interest and that, and that it's, it's critical for citizens in order to make informed decisions, uh, all the time, but even more throughout uh, a health emergency. Transparency goes into fostering honest communication and meaningful engagement with the citizens. So we are trying to empower individuals and collectives to create the tools and to and through the, the right tools to um, make their informed decisions and help them through their everyday life and through their uh, life planning through the the pandemic. One of the one of the core six areas that ended up being one of the core policy definitions is it's our transparency and then standards of course one of the 
largest reported challenges of governments was actually the standardization and interoperability of data. So as I was saying, not even between ministries from the same national administration, did they have the possibility of share data because they didn't have the same standards for, for the same thing. So uh, making sure that, you, that governments can actually develop standardization policies and interoperability policies so they can then open up data that actually makes sense and can be connected uh, throughout different data sets, it's super important. We know it takes a lot of time, but remember that Policy Plus is always about short-term and long-term policy calls, understanding that, that this is something that governments should be working all throughout their policies, not only in response to a health emergency, but like forever, but actually for the pandemic response, this was something that was reported as a challenge, even in the most more digitalized governments around the world. So this is something that needs to needs a lot of work on, and it's actually a bridge to the other project that we created. Let me make that bridge. Taking from that learning about the challenges that government to be able to share data even among the institutions of the same administration. We held global consultations specifically on this, kind of doing a double click to understand which standards were out, out there being used by, by governments, which, which data sets are, were being, were being demanded by the citizens from, from the world, like from the different administrations to understand which is the data demand side also. And for that, we also held local meetups, of course, virtual meetups. We created alongside with the government of, of New Zealand a meetup kind of methodology and held a couple of, of local meetups uh, in different air parts of the world to understand the local demand of data because we could, we could actually see, uh, what the kind of the global demand was that came like from open, open, opening, sorry, the data of public procurement, emergency, emergency budget changes that governments were doing, understanding, of course, epidemiological data, but those were global open data demands. So we needed to understand the local demand of data. And so we created this methodology and held local meetups to understand that local demand. And of course, we found similar, similar demands. As I was saying, like public procurement being one that, that everybody talked about, but also we found out local specific uh, demands. And then, of course, we developed, and Juan is going to talk about that, we developed alongside with, with Juan's team, uh, a COVID-19 taxonomy to understand how open data should look like. And we held experts uh, consultations, privacy, privacy folks that came into this consultation, epidemiologists, of course, and we worked with other open data organizations that were already working on creating standards, for example, open contracting partnership that were developing specific standards for the pandemic. And we took up on all of that and worked on the COVID-19 taxonomy. So I'm going to leave the floor uh, to Juan and his team to present the second project, which is the COVID-19 taxonomy. Great. Thank you, Nadi, for the introduction. So what we did, as uh, Nadi was saying, is we were tasked with trying to understand what was the data that was necessary in order to analyze and understand all the uh, COVID pandemic. And for that, we started working with the Open Data Charter work uh, group and, and also with other experts around the world to, to do what we are going to show you what we did now. So basically the, the objectives of the work that we did was to identify how uh, data was being published actually, as opposed to how ideally it was being, was supposed to be published uh, and also the quality of the data that was being published based on that and the analysis of what people needed in order to understand the pandemic, we needed to develop a new data cards and taxonomies and, and, and data sets. Uh, that would serve as a basis on what should be published and which, with which quality in order to uh, be able to share data uh, locally, internationally, and globally in order to understand what this new pandemic was. And in, order, in, and in that process also, what was the best practices and standards that could be reused in order to avoid reinventing the wheel? in order to, to develop all of this work that we were doing. The, the idea behind this was that if we shared information across uh, institutions, these institutions could be different countries or even different institutions from the same country, we could integrate this information and have, by having this information integrated, we could better analyze the, the pandemic. And if we could better analyze the pandemic, we could understand it and we could react properly and, and more 
strongly. What we did is we basically took data publicated from 24 countries and we analyzed all these data publications. Uh, we also uh, analyzed several uh, papers or research papers and, and other uh, policy papers that were saying what type of data were being were, were needed in order to understand the pandemic. And based on that, we actually downloaded all the data from these 24 countries. We analyzed which variables were being published by either by, by each of these countries and what are what were the needs basically that researchers and, and the international community had in order to analyze this. Based on that, what we understood is that in order to understand or analyze a pandemic, we needed to, to understand or analyze the five dimensions. Who are the people that are being infected? Where? The, lo the geographic location of these people, the time when these infections and, and how the infections was being developed, what was the infection or, or in this case, COVID and the different variants uh, that at the beginning were, there were no variants. When we started doing this, we said that like the in Dengue, there are different variants. Perhaps when COVID uh, evolves, there would be different variants. And now we know that there are different variants, lucky to uh, actually have that in mind. And what was the means of on transmission? Because if you remember at the beginning, it was test that, yeah, the COVID was only based on air and also in, in, the, in the surfaces that you touch and that you needed to clean your hands and so on and so forth. We needed to also understand whether this was true or, or there was other means of, of, of transmission for any disease. And this applies not only for the COVID pandemic, but for other pandemics as well. You just need to change the what, the, the other virus and the where. Uh, the when and, and the how, like the means of transmission. So uh, with that, basically what we came up is with a set of cards that explain how to use the different dimensions that we needed to, un to analyze in order to understand and react and prepare for the pandemic as a whole, right? Not just the epidemiological data, right? Because when you need to prepare or react to a pandemic, you need to know how the, the disease behaves, but also how, what do you need to do in order to contain the disease spread? So in order to do that, we devised these six general data cards and, and tables, and then I'll show you what they mean. Uh, there is a general card, which under, which defines the general data that you need to, to understand and, and analyze in order to publish data related to COVID in this case. Then the disease itself, basically, how do you surveillance the disease and how do it spreads, right? Then how do you prepare for the pandemic? All the things that you need to prepare as a country or as an institution. And then when you had already the pandemic, what were the legal and socioeconomical impacts on your country? So there were lockdowns, there were new laws and norms and regulations that were being uh, set up that prevented people from going out. You, you had quarantines and travel uh, restrictions and so on and so forth. So basically we needed to have all this information and the timeline of this information also to understand whether these travel restrictions or the, or whether these quarantines were actually affecting the disease spread. If you had this information, these different levels of information and you grow, you could actually emerge this information. You could be, you could actually analyze whether these measures were effective or not. And then basically all the other socio uh, socioeconomical indicators, the ones that normally uh, GDP and Gini index and so on and so forth that the uh, FAO and, and FAO or World Bank also analyze, analyzes normally and, and putting these indicators in the context of the disease, right? Basically this will serve as a basis to know whether or, or how much a disease affected economically or, or socially uh, a particular region, right? And then all the fiscal data, which is how much budget was allocated to, to fight the disease, what were the purchases that were done in order to fight the disease again and, and prepare for the disease and whether you were buying things at the same price or, or at the correct price, or you were uh, buying as a country things that were triple the price or 10 times the price or a hundred times the price, right? All this information basically is what we analyzed and we saw that was needed in order to well analyze and understand and prepare for the disease. I don't know whether we can go into the details if we have time, but basically 
each of the cards and the tables have a lot of information and a lot of variables that can be used to define each of these dimensions, let's call it like this. And we realized that there are too many, there were too many variables in some cases, but not all of, not all of the countries would have the capacity to first manage this number of information or this very number or, or very many number of, so we, we devise also a, a scheme where you could, so basically if you publish this minimal or basic set of variables, you could already understand very well the, the disease. But if you also publish these other variables, which is the intermediate level, you could also um, understand better in these other aspects of the disease. And there are some more advanced variables that could be used. And this applies to everything, right? To all the data cards that we have. And I'll show you how this works in a minute. And basically how, how we define this basic and intermediate and advanced set of variables is uh, by analyzing how many of these variables were already being published by the 24 countries that we analyzed. In, in the basic ones, most of the countries already publish this information. In the intermediate ones, between 20 and 50% of the countries already publish this information. And the advanced ones, very few countries publish this information. And these very few countries are basically the rich countries that have more resources to manage pandemic for a wide frame. So in general, as I said, I can, I prepared this presentation so I can save you and you, you can have the links for the cards and the metadata tables later. But here you can see the English card, for instance, these are the pandemic final cards. Basically it's a huge document that defines every card. What is the purpose of the card? The description, basically what is the metadata that is contained here, right? How you should publish the information in this part. What are the risks for the information that you are publishing here? Because the different, uh, parts of, of the different cards have different risks because if you have gender or age information, then you have to do different things as opposed to not having those variables. And these are the sort of things that we were consulting the, the international experts on privacy and data security. And what are the standards that you should normally use when you are publishing this information here? And, and here you have the general card that I was mentioning, the, the disease surveillance part. Basically, it tells you what you can do. If you publish its information, the description of the thing, what type of data you have here, right? The when, where, who, what that I was telling you about before is localized to each of the cards, right? Then you have the actual table that defines the variables and it gives you also an example on how the data would look like if you use this a table to, to publish this information. So if we go here, it's here. Uh, basically this is the pandemic data table. It uh, shows you basically the metadata. So these are all the metadata. These are the variables, the actual variables that should be published. And here you have the publication level. So basically what you could do is, so I don't have many resources and I want only the basic variables so you can filter out and you will only get the, the basic variables and you, or you can say, I want to go very high in the level and in, in the publication level, and I want to publish everything. And for each of the variables, basically you have the type of uh, value and a dictionary, what it means, each of the variables. And if there are standards or, or observations for each of the variables, you have that. And we knew that this was like very complicated in, in general to, to understand. So we actually already had examples from countries that were publishing data. So we took the data from different countries and we transformed it into these uh, tables. And here you can see data from Paraguay being uh, published, if it was published in, in, in this format, data from Colombia and Milan, um, and so on and so forth. So, in general, there are some variables that have a predefined set of values as in any data standard. So we also have these uh, values here. And then you have the other data cards for pandemic preparedness, the example, the, the values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the definition of each of the variables that should be used and an example on how the data would look like if you publish information in this format, it's already here. And, and this is a document that is already 
like publicly available. This is a very technical document. And we knew that this was a very technical document. That's why we prepared these other data cards, as we call them, that explains the whole purpose of each of the, of, of the dimensions or, or the data sets. Uh, and you have here like the health data. So it, explain, it explains all the PC surveillance part. And then you have here also uh, 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 here, for instance, in the risk part. So in the risk part, you have the re-identification of a person and its association with a particular case without warranting the privacy. That's a risk, right? And how we should mitigate that risk, we have here, right? So we have examples and the international uh, way of, of managing this risk. So we have examples of uh, data that is being published using this and also the use cases that I was telling you about. So we not only saw what was being published, but how people would use this information or, or the need of this information. So for each of the cards, we also have here a link of how would people would use or where would, would this information uh, be useful. So we have here pre uh, pandemic preparedness that I was telling you about, the legal and socioeconomical impact when you publish information related to lockdown and safety measure what we should publish about quarantine, travel and mobility restrictions, activities and services. So for example, I don't know, the soccer matches were forbidden or if it was allowed, how many people could go in and so on and so forth. And what were the conditions for people to get in, into the stadiums and so on and so forth would be published here. The socioeconomical indicators that I was telling you about, demographic. Again, we did a huge piece of work in, in defining all of this information. And, and what we realized at the end was all this information that, that we prepared here, even if it was prepared uh, with COVID in mind, it was easily, or it could be easily translated into other pandemic preparedness analysis, let's say so. So yeah, I don't know, uh, Nati, if I forgot something here or. Well, I think you, you did a great job, but if you need a couple more times, we still have uh, time. So no, as I said, uh, there, there is a lot of information here. Uh, mm -hmm. I would send you the, the, the presentation and, and you can see all of this again. All these resources, it's already uh, publicly available here. I can paste it yes. in the chat or you can paste that, paste that in the chat. Uh, and basically from here, you can see whether in Spanish or English, all the all the presentation of the data cards and, and all the, the things that we did with, with this. Uh, it's very technical, but it's very useful. And we have seen uh, some countries already starting using this as, uh, for example, Paraguay. So I'm based on Paraguay and I get pushed this locally mm -hmm. with the Ministry of Health. And so that's it from my side. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I was wondering if you could, if you could just give us just the, like a, a headline on how's it been for you trying to help out the, the health ministry in Paraguay working with these standards. Have they already had work on data standardization? Are they finding it difficult? Just share as much as you can. I know it's a, a working. We already did before this more contextualized uh, process of uh, data standardization for dengue with the Ministry of Health. So we had already experience with them trying to tell them first, the first big issue that you need to face when you're working with this is the fact that you need to uh, differentiate between information and data. Because when you're working with them, they are saying, yeah, but I already published the information related to whatever they are gay or COVID. And when you see the links that they send you is basically a, a pie chart or a graph of somehow of, of some sort. And what you need to explain to them is that, yeah, that's very nice. And that's super useful, but that, that's information already processed. What I need is the actual data that you use in order to create those graphs and having that uh, conversation at the beginning is hard. I already luckily had, had already that conversation with them and, and it was easier for me at least here. The second part is that when we were starting working with this, I, I told them, uh, you know what, we're starting working with these pandemic data cards and, and we will publish with the CAF and the open data charter, which are international organizations, these, uh, sort of. I don't know whether to call it them standards, but perhaps best practices. And it would be good if you could follow these instructions. And 
at the beginning, they were saying, yeah, but these are not you know, international standards from the World Health Organization. We cannot follow that and blah, blah, blah. And then basically what you need to do is show them the usefulness of sharing this information. And basically what you could gain by understanding and analyzing data internationally from other contexts that perhaps are similar to, to your local context. Then the other big part of the conversation is the level of aggregation or disaggregation that people or, or internet or, or health uh, institutions will use when publishing the information, because it's not the same to publish the number of COVID positive COVID cases by country or by, let's call it generically administrative division level one, which in Paraguay are departments or at the next level are our cities or the next level that I, that are neighborhoods. So, uh, the more disaggregated information you publish, the more, uh, or, or the better anal analysis you can do. And this is something that also relates to data privacy. So you need to do a, a good balance between what you, what the level of disaggregation of your information is and the data privacy that you need to consider always, because at least in Paraguay, and I think in many other countries, uh, you cannot by law publish a uh, health information related to a single person, right? You cannot say Juan had like two weeks ago, which I did, but, uh, <laughs> But let's see. I have the information, right? But let's see. You have the event. Yeah. Um, but well, we have sort of information cannot say that. We had a great example about that working on, on this with um, working with New Zealand, as most of it's a rather small uh, country as far as population and as far as as territory. So when the government started publishing COVID cases, they decided that they needed to provide the data not as disaggregated as they were getting it because it would have been possible to identify people. So for example, they, they did put in that data set, kind of the, the location, so the kind of city level or town level data. But as far as age, they created, they created like from zero to 10, from 10 to 20, because if you were from a specific town and had 15 years, it would have been you. Everybody would have known that it was you. Uh, and because as their towns are really small, that would have been, it wouldn't be possible to identify who it was. Unfortunately, as in every other uh, place in the world, numbers came up. So they were able to disaggregate the publication a little bit more and a little bit more after cases went up because re-identification didn't, wasn't a problem anymore. So there are a str strategies that governments can actually use to be able to publish the data as, as disaggregated as they can, also understanding and provide the right privacy, right privacy governance, if you will. And that was a great example on, on how they decided to do that because they're like, it's a small, uh, it's a small country and it was super easy to know who it was at the beginning. So yeah. There are I mean, a population of 60 million people. So. Yeah. So the, there's, there's always, the, there's always possible stra strategies to be able to publish and understand while taking care of privacy laws, but also taking care of the access uh, to information, which is super important. Do we now have any questions or uh, yes, we have one okay. wondering how you're going about promoting adopted standards by governments across the world. So do you want to unmute and just share your, your question and comments, Rob Brumman or Sean Arredit? There you go. Funny. Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> here. I am based in New York and I'm sorry I can't have my camera on at the moment. Thank you for a great presentation. I am just curious how you are getting various governments across the world or organizations to buy into this wonderful set of standards that you've created because you've done so much hard work to make them. How are you actually making people adopt this? So one of the one of the of uh, the things about these standards is that we actually created and while talking, for example, with open data charters adopters. So as I said, New Zealand was involved in, in this conversation and Mexico was involved in these conversations. So it's not that we did it and, and then we just presented it to governments like uh, a, a set of standards that they didn't know of. Then we're also and, and we have been, but we are trying to move forward with conversations with the World Health Organization. Of course, they are a leading organization with this with this topic and having them on board would be great. We are actually having those conversations. It's not easy and we're still uh, 
dealing with the pandemic. So of course, uh, those conversations go, go slowly, but we are actually doing that. And then we promote them throughout the open data charter community. So it's not just the adopters, but we also reach out and collaborate with governments that are not adopters, um, for example, Paraguay. And so we, the open data charter and the way that we work is we collaborate and promote these principles throughout the open data community, even if they are not adopters of the open data charter. So it's just, and I guess you probably know, the conversations with governments take up a lot of time getting that conversation going. Our, our main points of contact are the open data folks within governments so that we need to make the connection with health ministries, which are actually the primary creators of these of these uh, types of data. So those conversations take up time, but throughout our network, throughout also the collaboration with OAC, we are able to have those conversations. And uh, there are certain, certain governments that are taking uh, a look and deciding, and actually there are certain, certain sorry, data sets of the taxonomy that are being published. We also promote it. We didn't want it to reinvent the wheel and one maybe can also say a little bit more about this, but if they were, there were already existing open data standards, we, we included them into the taxonomy work. Like we weren't going to create a whole new public procurement open data uh, standard if there's one already out there that is being already used. So you will see if you navigate through the through the taxonomy uh, that there's a lot of already existing standards. So there's a lot of a lot of governments that were already publishing set of the whole bunch of, of, of data that comprehends the taxonomy in those standards. So it's like having a zillion conversations and uh, managing to, to uh, also understand their own agenda and helping out understanding the standards that are out there. Out there. I don't know, Juan, if you have something to add. Yeah, related to the reuse of the standards, the two biggest ones that were used in the fiscal data area are the fiscal open data package that the GIF community maintains, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, and they basically also have a guide for publishing fiscal data for COVID-19, right? Which uh, basically is budget data and related information for countries that are responding to the COVID and how their budgets are being changed and reallocated in order to respond to COVID. The other big one is I have many hats. So one of my hats it's also uh, as the technical leader for the implementation of the Open Contracting Data Standard in Latin America. So all the Latin American countries that wanted help in order to publish information or, or standardize information for public procurement related to COVID were using the open contracting data standard and we were helping all these countries to publish this information on the top of my head is Paraguay, Colombia, Honduras, uh, Argentina, Chile, Peru now. So we're working with many countries in order to to have this standardized information related to COVID-19 uh, procurement data. I have a question. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nati and Juan, for, for a great presentation. Uh, Nati mentioned that uh, equity, it's, a, it's one of the value of the, of the, the COVID data cards. And I have a question about how the governments can include the gender pers perspective in the, in the activity on, in the exercise to collect this data because all of in, in this in this meeting now, the, and the woman, uh, the woman are the mostly uh, population impacted neg negatively uh, of the pandemic. So, how did you include the gender perspective in this uh, COVID data card? So, this is my my question. Thank you. No, no. Yeah, with with lots of meetings related to that. <laughs> like I I keep this we have fifteen meetings just fifteen meetings just for defining the gender and sex variables in in the many data cards that, that use them, right? They are not the same and there are there are many perspectives for the from different countries. But the one that I found the most perhaps uh, down to earth response from different countries were like, we need to add variables that actually help us to understand the impact of the population for a specific, on the who, for a specific what, which is a disease. And as long as we need to differentiate, because we, we think that there are different societal groups that are differently impacted by the disease in this case, then we need to add the uh, more specific variables for that. For instance, if 
let's forget about gender for a minute. If we, because the other one that has this duality is race and ethnicity, which a lot of, which also requires a, a very comprehensive view on diversity, right? It's not just gender, but there are many ethnicities uh, in, in countries, especially in Latin America that are not even considered. And we don't even know what happens with them because we do not analyze them. And these are completely for, forgotten. And, and in Latin America, we have many uh, native population that are not even considered or are analyzed. And they were saying, okay, if we think that there is a different impact on the disease on that variable, then we need to include that variable. If we don't think that there will be a different impact on the population that we need to analyze whether it, they have a, I don't know, a different resistance, uh, whether they are immune or not, or whether recover, they do recover faster or not, because all of this information is super useful in order to try to see what do they do in order to be more resistant or to recover faster? Then we need to these variables. And, and basically, in general, in, in epidemiology, this is the response that we got from epidemiologists. Great. Thanks, Juan. I want to thank then everybody who joined, the organizers, everybody from the New York Open Data Week team that have helped organize this, everybody who joined, Juan. Bea and all, all the team that developed the taxonomy, all the team from OECD that worked with us on Policy Plus also. And I guess happy Open Data Week then to everybody. <laughs>